Do you ever feel like your stomach has a mind of its own? One day you're feeling fine, the next day you're bloated, gassy, or running to the bathroom, or not going to the bathroom. And when you finally get to see a doctor, you're basically told you have IBS. They might run some tests just to rule out some more serious problems, but they base your diagnosis just on your symptoms. What does IBS even mean? And what is the underlying cause of IBS? And more importantly, can you actually fix it? In this video, we're gonna go through the main causes of IBS and then what you can do about it. So what's actually causing IBS? IBS isn't random, it has real triggers. And we'll go through some of the biggest culprits and the underlying causes of IBS. So one of the biggest ones is post-infectious IBS. So if you ever had food poisoning and never felt the same since, that's because these infections can damage the gut nerves and also disrupt the gut bacteria. So even though you may be over that initial food poisoning or initial infection, your gut is never the same since, and you end up with these long-term gut problems. Another one is gut microbiome imbalances or dysbiosis. Your gut has trillions of bacteria, but if they get out of balance from antibiotic stress, diet, you can develop bloating, gas, and unpredictable digestion. Conditions like SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is a classic example of this imbalance in the gut bacteria. Other ones like candida or fungal overgrowth growth can also be common culprits. Another one is leaky gut, which is inflammation of your gut lining or intestinal permeability. And your gut lining is like a security guard, letting nutrients in, but keeping the toxins out of your bloodstream. And if you have leaky gut, these toxins from gut bacteria can get into the bloodstream, creating inflammation and exacerbating IBS symptoms. So food intolerances are another trigger of IBS. One of the big classes of food that can cause problems is called FODMAPs, or which stands for fructose, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, mallitol, and polyols, which in plain English are just fermentable carbohydrates that can trigger histamine, bacterial overgrowth, and create a lot of gas, bloating, and unwanted symptoms. And the low FODMAP diet is one of the best research diets for IBS. These aren't true like long-term allergies, but they're normally in response to this gut bacteria being out of balance. And once you get that back into balance, you don't need to stay on this low FODMAP diet. It really should be for a few weeks only. Other food triggers can be histamine foods, and this can be from bacterial overgrowth as well. Some people just don't tolerate histamine that well, and they might need a low histamine diet. Other ones are gluten, eggs, dairy. They can all be problems for the digestive tract in some people. Stress is a big trigger. Have you ever felt butterflies in the stomach when you got a speech or some major event coming up? Well, there's a massive gut-brain connection. And it's not just in your head, but what is in your head can directly affect your gut. This can affect motility and even alter the gut bacteria. So for some people, they might get diarrhea, but other people, it might be constipation. Your hormones can also affect IBS. For women, have you ever noticed around your period that your symptoms get worse? Estrogen and uh, progesterone can influence the gut function which can lead to diarrhea or constipation in some people. So getting the hormones balanced, especially around your menstrual cycle, can be a key to addressing IBS. And there can be other causes like autoimmune conditions, celiac, scleroderma, pernicious anemia. These can all affect gut function, and there are many more. So they're all causes, now I'll go to the triggers. So how do you figure out what's causing your IBS? Well, you need to do some testing and experimentation. I would start with uh, some basic medical tests to rule out things like celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and look at vitamins, minerals, making sure you're not uh, having problems with absorbing nutrients. This can give some clues into what might be going on. If you go to a doctor, they might check the basic celiac panel, but there's more advanced panels you can do for not just celiac, but gluten sensitivity. You can do a fecal calprotectin test if you've got chronic diarrhea or C-reactive protein. This is measuring gut inflammation, which is common in IBD. And that just helps to differentiate whether you have something more serious like Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, or IBS. Your doctor might run a colonoscopy or endoscopy. Once again, that's just looking at physical problems to make sure that you don't have polyps, precancer problems, or common upper GI things like reflux or H. pylori. Sometimes they run some basic stool tests, but they're just looking at the more serious pathogens and most people don't have them. The problem is many times these tests come back normal and that's when people are labeled IBS. It's like, well, the tests we've done are clear. You have irritable bowel syndrome. And, but it doesn't give you any real answers or what's the underlying cause. So what you can do is advance functional testing. 
And this gets to the root cause of what's actually going on. So the first thing I would start with is an advanced stool test like the Vibrant Wellness Gutsuma or something like the Diagnostic Solutions GI Map. These tests provide a detailed analysis of your gut health, looking at bacterial overgrowth, whether you have too much of the wrong bacteria, not enough of the good. Do you have enough digestive enzymes? Is there inflammation markers, candida, parasites? Are you lacking the bile salts? So it gives a really good understanding of what's going on and what might be the underlying cause of your IBS. Another test that I do is the Vibrant Wellness Wheat Zuma. This is not only a more advanced wheat test looking for celiac disease, but also it runs a whole bunch of different tests looking for gluten sensitivity. So some people are not celiac, but they're highly reactive to gluten or wheat. This test also measures leaky gut in detail. You'll often get zonulin on a stool test. This can go up and down. The wheat tumor will measure lipopolysaccharides, which are toxins produced by gut bacteria. And if they're found in the blood, that means you have leaky gut because they're getting through that gut blood barrier. Another test that you can do to see if someone has SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is a breath test. You can get individual breath tests or common tests that I run these days is the food marble test. This is a device that you buy yourself. And the good thing about it is you actually run multiple different tests. So you can see if you're reacting to lactulose, glucose, inulin, fructose. And you can also see whether the food you're eating are creating a high hydrogen and methane gas response as well. So the food marble is a great device for seeing how you're reacting to foods, but also diagnosing SIBO. Histamine and mast cell intolerance could be another cause of IBS. So you can do um, testing for DAO enzymes, histamine in the blood test. But one of the best ways to assess is going on a low histamine diet for a short period of time and seeing if symptoms improve. Histamine is produced by a lot of gut bacteria. So often the underlying cause is the gut bacteria and that has to be addressed. But a short-term low histamine diet can be helpful just to get the symptoms down. So once you understand the root cause of what's causing your IBS, then you can implement a specific treatment plan. So if you've got SIBO or bacterial overgrowth, that it might involve a short-term low FODMAP diet. And this can help up to 50 to 70% of IBS patients. Gluten and wheat restriction, if you cut out gluten for a month, feel so much better. And you can add it back in and see if that's actually the trigger or something else is causing the problems. If a low histamine diet helps by reducing down things like aged cheese, you know, alcohol, fermented foods. And so if diet, once you've cut out the low FODMAPs or cut out gluten, dairy, eggs, or those common triggers, the key is to reintroduce them back in one category at a time to work out what might be your trigger. And sometimes once you heal the underlying gut, you're no longer reacting to those foods. Doing elimination diets is often better than doing you know, food intolerance testing. Especially the IgG tests, you're better off doing a wheat zuma, dairy zuma. These are much more advanced tests than the basic food intolerance tests. And the stool test results can help to understand if adding in prebiotics, probiotics would be good for you or not. And doing tests like the gut zuma, you can identify which strains that you're low in. So you can be really targeted in the treatment plan, knowing what strains of lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, or even the spore-based probiotics that you could be low in. Prebiotics are great for IBS, but they've got to be started slowly. That's things like sun fiber, PHGG, inulin, arabinogalactins. They're helping to feed the right bacteria that help to produce the short chain fatty acids like butyrate, reducing down inflammation levels. Fiber can be great for gut health and for many people it's fantastic. Sometimes with IBS though, you've got to be really careful with fiber. And sometimes a low fiber diet, which is what the low FODMAP diet is, can be great. And then you just need to add the fiber back in slowly. If you add it in too quickly, that can flare up symptoms, but fiber is great for the microbiome, you've just got to go slow in adding it back in. If you have bacterial overgrowth, the best thing to do is using herbal treatments. This can be things like berberine, oregano oil, allicin, biocidin, and you don't want to use antibiotics because they can often cause more problems than what you started with. For some people, it's a nervous system thing and motility agents like Modal Pro, Iberagas can be really helpful. And then to work on that gut-brain connection, the Nerva app is a hypnosis app. And to be honest, I was a bit skeptical about guided hypnosis for treating IBS, but I've just seen so many many clients get great results with this. And this ties back into the whole dress of being a major trigger for gut issues. So other things like breath work, meditation, they can all be helpful as well. So IBS isn't a life sentence, but you need to get the right testing done to work out what's causing your IBS. So getting the right testing done, working out your underlying cause for you is very important. 
what worked for your friend or some, someone you read online doesn't always mean it's gonna work for you. And once you get the results, that can help you have a targeted treatment plan to treat your IBS. So to find out more about the tests that we run, like the Gut Zoomer, Wheat Zoomer, Dairy Zoomer, have a look in the description below and we'll put links to the Gut Zoomer, Wheat Zoomer, Dairy Zoomer, and the other functional tests that we run at Planet Naturopath. Leave a comment if you've had IBS and found that something in particular has worked really well for you. I'd love to know. And if you'd like to find out more about the Gut Zoomer test, watch this video and that'll explain that in detail.